Well, this morning we are um, we're very fortunate to have a guest with us today. Uh, the president, uh, new president, we were at like two years, two years, which in the uh, college president world is actually relatively new. Uh, president of uh, Valley Forge in uh, Pennsylvania, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. We're so blessed to have him this morning, uh, Reverend David Kim. You see a little blurb about him. Now, here's the great thing. We sponsored a child yesterday. Uh, we picked up a child for, uh, to, to sponsor from that Compassion International uh, from Ghana. And so he grew up as a missionary son in, uh, in Ghana. And so uh, we're just very fortunate to have uh, President Kim with us this morning. And so if you would, please welcome him as he comes to minister to us this morning. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor to be with you, uh, Pastor Spencer. Thank you. Um, I don't. I know that you don't know me very well, and uh, so it's a big risk for you this morning. Um, you just don't know what I'm going to say, and uh, you took the chance that uh, you know the president of your regional school here uh, would be able to say the right things this morning. Why are you a little nervous? Okay, you should be. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, Pastor Spencer and uh, Heather, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real privilege and honor to be here with you. Uh, I don't take these opportunities lightly, and uh, it's truly um, a blessing to be with you. Um, I met Pastor Joe this morning uh, by the booth. Um, how are you? You're the next-gen pastor, right? Okay, and uh, I was, I'm so tired from coming from a conference. I was speaking in New York. And my gosh, the energy that you have this morning. I'm an introvert, and he, you know what I'm talking about? He, he took me by surprise this morning, and I'm so sorry that I wasn't very hospitable this morning. <laughs> okay, but uh, great to meet you. Finally, I've been seeing you on, on social media, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be here. As Pastor Spencer said, um, I'm, uh, I grew up as a missionary's kid uh, in Ghana, West Africa. And uh, many people get confused uh, by my appearance, and uh, yes, uh, they're like, they're like Africa, okay, yes, Africa, and I'll tell a little bit more of the story of, uh, of my journey, but, um, but how many of you just know that uh, God uses unlikely people and weak people to do his work, and uh, when... When God chooses unlikely people to do his work, um, there is a purpose. Uh, there's a very specific purpose that God has. And uh, I'm so excited to be uh, a part of this region and part of the school that uh, equips disciples for the kingdom. And, uh, and it's just really awesome to partner with all of you here uh, this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Um, we're going we're gonna to delve into this text a little bit. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to verse 39. Um, you're gonna, as I'm reading this text, you're going to find that there's all these scriptures and, and, and messages and texts that uh, you're probably very familiar with. And you're like, well, I didn't know all of them were in the same text. <laughs> okay, but uh, these are wonderful scriptures, and uh, I want to help unpack this for us this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to verse 39. Um, you, it's a very, very familiar text. It says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Uh, usually, Assemblies of God preachers stay away from the text following verse 28 because of the word predestination. It's not what you think it is. I will explain that in a moment. But verse 30 says, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of the God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. I pray this morning that your presence would fill this room. Lord, I pray that you pierce our hearts with your words. I pray that we would not go home the same way we came. I pray that you would encourage us with your word, show us your uh, glory, show us your love, transform our hearts from the inside out. I'm not worthy to stand here, but I pray that your anointing, your presence would be here and that we would be uh, transformed by your presence. We love you. Be with us. Be with this church, Lord God. Bless this church, O oh Lord. Do something incredible and marvelous through Lighthouse, Lord God. I pray that you would um, watch over every single person in this room. Watch over the leadership, Lord God. I pray that, that you would just pour out your spirit on this church, Lord God, and do amazing things. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I mentioned to you, um, uh, I grew up in Ghana, West Africa. Um, a lot of people do get confused, really. Uh, when people come to our school, when they don't check the website, okay, they usually walk right by me because they can't possibly think a young guy like me. Thank you, thank you. Could be the president of the school. Uh, you know, I have vice presidents that look the part, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, and uh, so they, they all jetline to that person as, uh, and introduce themselves. But anyway, um, so I, I actually grew up in Ghana, West Africa. I moved to New Jersey uh, when I was 13. Um, yes, we're in New Jersey, right? I forget what state I am. <laughs> okay, um, uh, to northern Jersey, an all-Italian town at the time, okay? So can you imagine? I had, I had an African accent, okay? Uh, when I came to the States, I, yes, Asian dude, African accent in an all-Italian town from middle school. To say that nobody wanted to sit with me for lunch is an understatement, <laughs> okay? Um, so I came, I came to uh, New Jersey, and then eventually uh, my parents were uh, doing some missions work in Dominican Republic, and then uh, became church planters of all places, not here in the East Coast, but in the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, okay? I was too, I was too Asian, okay, in a school of 600 kids. Okay, um, so can you imagine my experience, right? It's crazy, right? And so we went over there. I graduated uh, over there high school, and then I moved, my parents moved to Connecticut to plant another church. Uh, you know how many, sometimes, uh, sometimes when you're too good at church planting, you get to move a lot, okay? Because they're, they're not called to pastor a church a long time, so they're church planters. So they would plant it, they would buy the building, and then move, okay? Just, just when things would get better, they would move. And so... Uh, uh, we moved back to the East Coast at the time, obviously, um, Valley Forge is the regional school for the Northeast, and so I, I came to Valley Forge. I'm actually an alum of the University of Valley Forge, and then I'll tell this that story just in a, in, in a moment, but um, I came to Valley Forge. I graduated in 97. Okay, um, just in case you're wondering how old I was. Okay, I graduated in 97, and uh, I spent most of my um, adult life, okay, in ministry in New York City as well as Latin America. And so I spent almost 13 years building schools in uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, and other places in Latin America, a lot of ministry in Ecuador and in different places. And so uh, it's, been a, it's been a journey. And, and all of these experiences and places that I've been to, I've planned it all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just planned everything, and everything worked out exactly as I planned. 
How many of you know God takes you through life that just you didn't expect? You know, there are experiences, relationships, places. Some of you, you're still wondering how God led you to your spouse. No, you're, you're like, that's a blessing, Pastor. Don't put me in that. Okay, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You just, certain things in life just happens. Um, God puts you through things, and you just don't know why you're going through certain things in life. And uh, how many of you also know that there are uh, good things, bad things, and ugly things in life? We live in a very broken world. And um, so when I read texts like this, where it says, you know, if, you know, God works all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, a yellow flag goes up and go, what in the world do you mean by that? Because, look, um, you know, when you're following Jesus, uh, it doesn't mean you are exempt from illnesses. It doesn't mean that when the hurricane comes, th comes through your island that your house is going to be the exempt. Uh, occasionally, through God's signs and wonders, those things do happen, but that's not a rule of law, right? Where if you follow Jesus, God will work everything out for you. And so when you read texts like this and when you hear preachers, and by the way, I've heard all my life preachers tell me, if you just love the Lord, come to church on Sunday, God will work all things out for the good if you love him. And I'm like... Okay, I want to make sure that I love him properly so that God will work out all things for me. And so what does that mean? Okay, I got to tithe. I got to go to church. I got to do this. I got to make sure that I'm doing the right things to make sure I'm not cursing, make sure I'm not doing these things so that God will work all things out. Is that what this text is saying? I want to tell you that that's actually not what this text is saying, okay? Actually, in this world, God promises that you will have many troubles, Okay, so just because you follow Jesus Christ doesn't mean that your circumstances are going to turn and change every day to something good that's in your mind. So then the question is, what is this text saying? So I want to find out what this good means. If, you know, God works all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, right? I want to know what that good is. In order for us to know what that good is, you always have to le read Scripture in context. You can't take words or specific sentences out of the Bible, out of the context and the flow of conversation, right, or flow of thought. And if in this verse, you, verse 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It says the very next verse, Four, it's connected. You can't read verse 28 separated from verse 29. It says, for, okay, those who God foreknew, he also predestined. Don't be alarmed by that text. It basically means preordained. How many of you are glad this morning that we serve a God who has a plan? That the things are just not coincidentally happening all over the world. God has a master plan, and he's working throughout the history of the universe to accomplish his mission and his purposes. And we, as children of God, God has a plan for us in that master plan of his mission, of his purpose, that God is working things out in our lives, and God is working things out for his mission. So for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So that word conform is the root word in Greek morphe. It's the, it's the word that we get the word metamorphosis or it's like, you know, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's a conforming, it's a total transformation that takes place. How many of you watch HGTV? Anybody? It's okay. We're at church. Confess your sins of addiction. Okay. It's totally okay. Um, I watch those house remodeling shows, and uh, sometimes I'm like, I can't turn it off. You just keep going from show to show, and it's the same darn thing. Make the house 
open space, you know? You know what I'm talking about? Like 20, 30 years ago, everything was to be compartmentalized. Now everyone's open kitchen floor plan. You know, it's, every show is opening up the, it's the same plot. Open up the walls, open up this, open up that. But I, I can't stop watching it. It's over and over again, okay? Um, how many of you know Joanna Gaines? <laughs> Magnolia. If you don't know who she is, don't get to know her. It's like a vortex, it's like a twilight zone. Once you get in it, you can't get out, okay? And uh, my wife is addicted to Joanna Gaines. She follows her social media, she watches her shows. I don't understand what's going on, but you know what I mean, right? So some of you are like, who is Joanna Gaines? I'm, don't find out. Okay, the moment you find out, you'll be wasting a lot of your time. Okay, but when you see these shows, how many of you know that there's sometimes they take over homes that are totally messed up and broken, right? And uh, this kind of metamorphosis is not the idea of going into a home and just kind of readjusting some walls, putting out the porch, painting the outside of the house. This is not this metamorphosis, okay? This is not this more this is not the conforming that it's talking about. It's actually talking about actually the foundation of the house, actually completely demolishing it, and then rebuilding a new foundation upon the rock of Jesus Christ to rebuild your house upon this solid rock. It's to conform then your life, my life, into the image of Christ. So the good in verse 28, it says, when God works all things for the good, that good is talking about verse 29. It's talking about that good is for you and for me to be conformed, transformed, changed from the inside out into the image of Christ. So that's the good. So God will actually use the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life and to redeem your experiences, to redeem all the things that you're going to go in through your life, even the ones that you made a mistake on. How many of you know, sometimes we have consequences for our mistakes. Sometimes we have consequences for other people's mistakes that they make that have consequences on us. We know that even natural disasters and all of this stuff of this broken world where we're just passing through, God will use all of those things to do what? To conform you into the image of Christ. For we are not here permanently. We're not here permanently. We are passing through. This is not our permanent home. And so as long as we live on this earth, all the good, the bad, and the ugly, God wants to use it to conform you into the image of Christ so that God may be able to use your life for his purposes. Amen. How many of you are thankful today that God redeems all experiences of life for the good? God only, not re only redeems everything in your life, but God is with you and God has not abandoned you when thing, bad things happen to your life so that we're able to trust Him. Now, um, when I came to Valley Forge um, at the age of 17, um, you know, I, I was like churched out. Do you know what that means? Okay, like I literally graduated seminary in my mother's womb. Like, I have a picture to prove it. My father was graduating from seminary, and I was in my mother's womb in the graduation ceremony of my dad's seminary. You don't know how many sermons I've heard over the years. Okay, you don't know how many sermons I've heard over the years. You don't know how many hymns I've sang. Well, we grew up singing hymns. We, look, I, I grew up, I'm hymned out. I am churched out. I am Christianese to the max. Okay, I mean, I'm one of those. And so when I came to Valley Forge, I thought I knew Christ until my sophomore year, my second semester of my sophomore year, I was sitting in the back, like, kind of like, like right, right over there. Um, and the Lord 
I didn't know that all those chapel services that I was required to go was having an impact on me. And um, one day, just out of nowhere, the Spirit of the Lord came upon my life, and for five hours I wept. I wept in the presence of God. I had no idea that I had a longing to belong because of all the times where I've moved all over the place of being marginalized, and I just had no idea that I was so broken, and the Lord touched my heart, touched my life, let me know that He loves me, He knows my name, He knows me. And uh, I was just so overwhelmed with the presence, I dedicated my life to the Lord, and I really thought that, you know, I was going to conquer the world for Jesus now, okay? And I was like, you know what, all these preachers coming in and saying, my destiny, okay? So I'm like, let's go tackle the destiny, and so I thought, really? that uh, from that moment on, God's going to use my life greatly, and He has. I'm not saying He didn't. I'm just telling you that I really thought that there's things would just go really, really well for me, that God would do certain things in my life, but um, I had no idea that after dedicating my life to Christ, that my father would be diagnosed with leukemia, and that he would, um, he would die at the age of 58 after serving the Lord for 38 years in the jungles of Kumasi in West Africa, um, I watched him. I watched him serve the Lord. He didn't own a darn thing. He served the Lord faithfully. And yet, he died one of the most gruesome deaths I've ever seen in my life. I was a part of a very, very large global organization. Our just local church was 5,000, and so I got to see a lot of things. Uh, we built schools and hospitals all over the world, and so I got to do a lot of, lot of big things. And so when you are in a big organization, there's two or three things that you're guaranteed to see a lot. Number one, a lot of funerals. Number two, a lot of hospital beds. Number three, a lot of babies, <laughs> okay? You know what I'm talking about, right? I have seen all kinds of sicknesses in hospitals. I've seen people die. I've seen car accident death. I've seen um, all kinds of crazy stuff. I have never seen in my entire life still today the kind of painful death that my ex dad experienced for eight years he fought. Eight years. I was, at one point, I was his donor for a stem cell transplant. I have never seen in my entire life the kind of suffering that my father suffered. And I would be asking through that process, God, where are you? Where are you? What are you doing? I had no idea that when I dedicated my life to Christ that that my second daughter would be born and uh, eventually be diagnosed with epilepsy. We were planting a church in New York City. Uh, we were at that time, we were planting multiple churches, and uh, one of the churches that we planted was a Hispanic church. And uh, we had the launch team meeting. Oh, my God, the Holy Spirit came upon that group. The Holy Spirit came upon that team, and we had an incredible prayer meeting. That night when I went home, my daughter went into a seizure that very night, and she wouldn't come out. The longer she stays in, there could be brain damage. We were very, very concerned, and we had to call the ambulance. And I remember holding her head in the ambulance going, God, where are you? What's going on here? I had no idea that when I dedicated my life to Christ at the age of 18, that um, I myself would go through something like that. Um, eventually, we moved our family to Ecuador for a business as missions endeavor, and we were exporting cacao beans. It's a sub it's an oppressive supply chain for agro commodities training and trading. And so, I wanted to be a part of the solution, not only building schools to making sure that there's economic opportunities for students who are graduating. So we moved our family to Ecuador to do the work of God. I was coming back from uh, a, a major order uh, inventory in the farms, and I was coming back, and and uh, the oncoming traffic swerved into our lane, my driver, a young guy, inexperienced, instead of slowing down, there's only two lanes. So when the oncoming tra traffic came into our lane, instead of slowing down, he jerked right. Okay? When he jerked right, he hit the only massive tree for 45 miles on the side of the road. 
Our pickup truck wrapped around the trunk of the tree going 60 miles an hour. It crushed only my side, and it crushed my face. And uh, so this eye that you're looking at is not my eye. It's actually acrylic. It's plastic. I lost my eye in that accident. Um, I have three screws um, in, in my face. Um, I went through three reconstructive surgeries. This is in 2013, January 7th. And um, I lost everything. I lost my business. I lost not only my vision, but I lost the vision that I thought God gave me for as missions. Um, I had to bring my family back to the States. And um, I remember uh, being in my brother's little apartment. He had a family of five. I had a family of six. And I was killed over trying to recover. And I asked the question, Lord, where are you? Where are you? And I want you to know this morning that um, I'm not sure that those kinds of painful moments in my life is over. As long as I'm living on this earth, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. But do you know, in each of those major crisis moments of my life, God revealed to me over and over again His faithfulness, that He did not leave me or forsake me, that God is with me, that He loves me, and that I can trust Him through the process that this is world is a temporary world. And I, um, can I just say something openly from my heart? I am so tired of churches making people's lives believe that they're supposed to make their best life here on earth. This is not biblical. We are passing through. We're supposed to lay our lives down no matter what we face for the glory of Jesus Christ to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords who saved us. That no matter what we face in life, to be able to trust Him that God is working all things because we know that this world is temporary. I'm even tired of seeing churches saying, welcome home. This is not our home. You shouldn't be comfortable in this church. Okay, you're gathered here to be edified, to be built up, to be armies, to be ambassadors, to be ministers of the gospel in your community. This is not something we come here to kind of receive and, and to see how we can better our lives. Do you know that God has already given you the greatest gift that you can ever experience and receive, and His name is Jesus Christ? the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are wealthy and rich not because of the wealth and riches of this world, but because we are rich and wealthy because we have Jesus Christ in our hearts, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And here's what I want to share with you this morning, that this text doesn't just end there. It continues. It talks about, in verse 31, let's look. I want you to turn to verse 31. I love this text. It says here, so the question I have is, if God is working all things for the good of those who love him, how are we able to trust him in the midst of trial? How are you able to trust him when your daughter is not coming out of the seizure, when your father is dying a gruesome death, when you yourself has lost everything? How are we able to trust someone when we're going through these things? And Paul has an answer. I love the Apostle Paul speaking because the Apostle Paul does this. He, he does this. He goes, I'm jabbing, but I'm preparing you the right hook. Okay? And uh, how many of you know Muhammad Ali? Okay? I love Muhammad. He's master at jabbing, and he's setting you up. Okay? This is what the Apostle Paul is doing through the first eight chapters of the Romans. He's jabbing, 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 communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in verse 32, he punches the blow. Here's what verse 31, 32 says. Then what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us... Who can be against us? Verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, 
but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things and take care of us? So let me tell you what this text is saying. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. It is on this basis that we're able to trust whatever we're going through. It's, listen carefully to me. Our trust in God is not based on our faith and our passion. Oh, I'm going to trust God. You need to will yourself to trust God. Our ability to trust God is not on the basis of our strong will to trust God. It's on the basis of the love of God demonstrated through the Son of Jesus Christ. It's on that basis that we're able to trust. Okay? So let me explain it this way. I have a son. Okay, I have four children. Okay, um, I don't, oh, there's the clock. Okay. <laughs> I have, I have uh, four kids. I'm going to tell you how old they are. My first one is 18, second one is 17, third one is 15, and my fourth is seven, <laughs> okay? I'll tell you about him in a moment. But my first one, 18, just went off to college. She did not come to Valley Forge. <laughs> Sorry. I'm. I'm not exaggerating here. It still hurts when I say that. Because um, we're, we're making an incredible discipleship school, and uh, I'm really bummed out that she's missing out. But she told me this. She said, Daddy, uh, you are my grade school principal, and you're not going to be my college president. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, uh, all right. So, okay, she's at another school that I'm not going to mention, um, somewhere in Philly. Okay, but... Uh, <clears throat> My son was born, um, surprise to us, not to God. Uh, he was actually born in Ecuador, okay? So he is an Ecuadorian citizen. He has an Ecuadorian passport. He has an Ecuadorian social security number. And, uh, you know, there's something unique about him. All of our family is really boring. We're all very introverted, and we're just very boring people. I don't know what happened to this boy. <laughs> We think that it's because my wife drank water in Ecuador when she was pregnant with him. Okay, it must be the Latin something going on. But he literally dances like the floss dance, the dabbing. When you see him, that's how he greets you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am not exaggerating at all. Okay. You talk to the students, they'll tell you, okay, oh, Eli, oh, yeah, he has spunk. Okay. He just, da every time the music turns on, he's dancing. He's dancing. I'm literally going to the gym. gym. I'm seeing him dance. I come back after an hour. He's still dancing. <laughs> okay. That's, that's how he is. He's a bundle of joy, incredible, fun, fun character. Now, he has... Okay, listen to me. He has this interesting thing. If you ask him, where are you from? He'll say, I'm from Ecuador. Um, so, Asian, American, Ecuadorian. Please pray for him. Okay, like, I'm really concerned about his identity. <laughs> okay, um, he's going to be an identity crisis later on, okay? So when you, when you actually talk to him, he'll talk to you in Spanish, and he'll, he really believes he's Ecuadorian, okay? And uh, so he, and his sisters doesn't help. Okay, so when, like, I go to a lot of Hispanic churches, because I have Hispanic connections, and he'll sit right there, and I'll be like, hey, usually when I go to Hispanic church, I'll say, hey, anybody from Guatemala, anybody from Honduras, and I'm trying to find, and then I'll go, hey, anybody from Ecuador? He'll be playing a game. He'll stand straight up as soon as as he hears Ecuador, he'll stand like this. <laughs> Not only will he stand up and raise his hand, he'll look around to see if there's other Ecuadorians. <laughs> and then when he sees one, he'll do this. <laughs> and then he'll do this. <laughs> I am not kidding you. No exaggeration. When he gets hurt at home, he has three teenage sisters and a mom. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, every little thing is like something literally died. Okay, and uh, 
I'll hear this, a thump, and all of a sudden you'll hear all these footsteps rushing, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, Eli's really hurt. Okay, and all of a sudden you'll hear my daughter's going, oh, Eli, Eli, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, oh my gosh, something seriously went, ha went wrong, right? I'm like, he's seriously hurt. So I'm rushing. I'm rushing to the living room to find out what happened. And in the pile with my daughters all over, like kissing him all over the place, are you okay? Eli will s look up to me and goes, Daddy, I got a sc scratch, a little scratch. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is, please pray for my son. Okay, I'm really concerned about his well-being. Okay, um, four moms, that's what he has. But how many of you know whether you have three teenage girls or not, how many of you know when your kid hurts, you hurt? That you adore your kids, that you would take a bullet for your child, that you would come in the harm's way to make sure to protect your child, correct? Would you ever think for a stranger that you would push your son, your child, in harm's way to say somebody else. Would you do that? You wouldn't, right? Think about it. I'm the earthly parent, imperfect parent. That's the kind of love I have for I have, the love that I have for my son, Elijah. Okay? I'm an earthly, imperfect parent. But according to Scripture, the love that our Heavenly Father has for the son is perfect love. The Father's love for Jesus Christ is perfect love. And he says, God did not spare his own son. Let me put it to you in this context. I know I'm running out of time, but let me put it to you in this context. It says in Scripture that Jesus became sin for us. I want to explain this. You ever see a documentary on sex trafficking of little girls? When you see the predators on those documentary, do you feel very violent towards that person? The vile and detestable acts, oh, I get violent. I have imaginations of how I want to hurt that predator. Okay, I, I think that, no, I really, my wife and I have discussions of how our judicial system is not sufficient to handle predators like that. But think about this. That's how a sinful, imperfect person like this feel towards that heinous act. The holy and just and perfect God, when he sees the sins of this world, imagine the wrath upon the consequence of the vile and despicable sinfulness of this world. But it says in Scripture that Jesus became sin and took on the wrath of God. Are you following me? The consequence, the wrath, the justice of the perfect God, because God loved us, he did not spare his own son to die on that cross for us. He became sin. Are you getting me? God did not spare his own son for who? For you and for me. You know, they introduce me nowadays as president of a college. I look fine on the outside, right? I look like I could pass for an ordained pastor. I have news for you. If I were to put it, my thoughts up on that screen, I wouldn't be able to stand here to preach to you. I'm sinful to the core. I'm not deserving of this kind of grace. I am sick and broken, and yet God did not spare his own son, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, laid down his life upon that cross so that we would not experience that wrath, that God Jesus Christ substituted himself for us. It is on this basis, listen carefully, it is on the basis of this love. It says, 
who then shall we say, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him? If he did not spare his own son, why will he not take care of you? Why would he abandon you in your moment of need? Why would he let you go along and go through the difficult circumstances of your life alone separated from him. If God did not spare his own son, uh, son for you and for me, he will be with you. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or any of these things separate us from the love of God if God did not spare his own son? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced because God did not spare his own son that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, because God did not spare his own son, neither the present nor the future, because God did not spare his own son, Son, any powers, neither death, nor height, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. God works all things, even the ugliness of this life. We can trust him on the basis of his love on the basis that God did not spare his own son. I know some of you are struggling today. If you're not struggling today, believe me, there will come a time where you will be suffering. It's the promise. But when those moments come, you can trust him. You can trust him not on the basis of your faithfulness, you can trust him on the basis of God's faithfulness, the one who did not spare his own son, to watch over your life, to conform you into the image of Christ, to use your life and my life for the glory of God, that this world is a temporary world, that we are going towards eternity with him. As long as we have breath in life here on earth, we will live for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, for God did not spare his own son. Would you stand with me at this time? <laughs> praise God. Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. This is why he's worthy of our praise. This is why the King of Kings is worthy of our worship. This is why we praise. This is why we sing. This is why we breathe. This is why we live. Because God did not spare his own son. He's worthy of our worship, amen. I want you to bow your heads for a moment. I want you to open your hands in front of you just for a moment. Would you just begin to thank him all over this room to say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you, God, no matter what I'm going through, that you will, we will never be separated from your love. Would you ask the Lord right now, some of you need the comfort and peace of God in your life. Some of you, you're asking and waiting for answers from God. I want you to know that God is here. God has not abandoned you. Would you at this time surrender your bitterness, your anger, your frustrations to say, Lord, I trust you this morning. I trust you this afternoon. Would you, let's make this a house of prayer at this time, just all over this room, just for a minute or two. Whatever the Lord puts in your heart, would you pray? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, come, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit, oh God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, in this room. Jesus. 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 Reveal the beauty of Christ in our lives today. Reveal the beauty of Christ in our lives today. Help us, Lord Jesus, to fall in love with you because of your love for us. Help us to trust you once again. 
Help us to trust you with the little things of our lives. Help us to trust you with the crisis of our lives. Help us, Lord God, by the reveal the beauty of Christ into our lives, oh God, right now, all over this room. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ demonstrated his love for us. Oftentimes we feel as though we walk through these challenges and struggles without understanding. We walk through them alone. We should walk through them with the faith and certainty that God walks through them with us. Life is hard. It's like we talked about last week. Being a Christian every day is hard. It's hard. But Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. We should be encouraged in that, even in the difficult and dark times. Jesus is with us. <laughs> 